Would you follow along with me today? Let's stand together uh, for the reading of God's Word, and let's read this passage together. When all of the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all of the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so the people of Israel could cross, they lost heart and they were paralyzed with fear because of them. And at that time, the Lord told Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise this second generation of Israelite. So Joshua made flint knives and he circumcised the entire male population of Israel at Gibbeth Haraloth. Joshua had no circumcision. Uh, Joshua had to circumcise them because all of the men who were old enough to fight in the battle when they left Egypt had died in the wilderness. And those who left Egypt had all been circumcised, but none of those born after the exodus during the years of the wilderness had been circumcised. And the Israelites had traveled in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men who were old enough to fight in battle when they had left Egypt had died. For they had disobeyed the Lord, and the Lord vowed that he would not let them enter the land that he had sworn to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. And verse 7, So Joshua circumcised their sons, those who had grown up to take their father's places, for they had not been circumcised on the way to the promised land. And after all the males had been circumcised, they rested in the camp until they were healed. And then check this out in verse 9, which is where we'll spend most of our time this morning. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt, so that place has been called Gilgal to that day. Lord God, we thank you today that you have rolled away the shame of our past. And we ask you today to teach us, to inspire us, and to give us hope and strength today as we study and as we preach your word. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone has a past. Everyone has a past. Every single person that's here today has something in their life that could cause them to feel a sense of shame. In chapter 5, verse 9, in the New Living Translation, it uses the word, your shame has been rolled away. But in some other translations, it uses the word reproach. Your reproach has been rolled away. But the word reproach is the same word as the word shame. It means disgrace or dishonor. And the Israelites had some dishonor or some disgrace in their life First of all, they had spent 400 long years as slaves. If you can just imagine that. Ten generations of Israelites, that's all they had ever known. was slavery, slavery. Egyptians standing over them, whipping them, beating them, making them work seven days a week. No choices, no freedoms, no opportunities to dream or to do anything different day to day. It was the same every day single day of their existence. And so as a result, there was a lot of shame in the Hebrew people. There was a lot of reproach that they felt. I mean, they had been oppressed. And, and, you know, even though they had been set free, their minds had not been set free. Their hearts had not been set free because they had lived in bondage so long. But notice the text that says, after 40 years... The Israelites have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they finally get to Canaan. I mean, 40 years is a long time, isn't it? Many of us in this room are not even 40 years old total. That's a long time. 40 years. But while the people had left Egypt, Egypt had not left them. They had a spirit of reproach. They had shame in their life. And they were the most despised people on the planet. Oh yeah, those Hebrew people, they say they worship this big bad God, but they're over there running errands for the, Egypt, the Egyptians, and they're oppressed, and they got nothing, and they got no land to call their own. And, you know, people just look down on Hebrew people. They were kind of the scum of the earth in many ways. And there was reproach in the heart and the life of the people. 
They were the laughing stock of all nations. But if you feel wrong on the inside, you will never accomplish what God has purposed for you to do. Isn't it interesting that the day before this great battle of Jericho, which by the way we're getting to next week, which is one of the greatest victories in all the Bible, on the eve of this victory is the moment where God says, your shame has been rolled away. In other words, I've got to do something in you before I can do something through you. I have to do something in your heart and in your mind and in your life before I can take you to the place of conquest. In order for you to be victorious, you have to be able to put your past behind you. But the spirit of reproach, the shame that the Israelites had felt was such a, it was a curse over their life and over their race and their, and their generation. And God saw that. Uh, the people echoed this shame and reproach. Uh, if you remember in Numbers 13, the Israelites got to the very border of the land of Canaan after they had left uh, Egypt. And just days later, they're ready to go in and God's prepared them. And what happened? They sent the spies into the land and 10 of the spies came back and they said, we can't do it. We're not big enough. We're like little grasshoppers, you know. We don't have the training. We don't have the education. We don't have the military, you know, might. We, we don't have what it takes to do it. And so God says, okay, if you guys don't have the faith, y'all can just wander around for 40 long years. Uh, when Moses went to the Israelites and he said, listen, God spoke to me in a burning bush and I'm going to liberate our entire race from Egyptian captivity. He expected a celebration. He expected all of the elders of Israel to be applauding and clapping and celebrating. Yay, Moses! What did they do? Moses, you can't do that. No, nah, man, they're going to make us work harder. You're crazy, Moses. Don't do it. You know, they, they, listen, the Hebrew people were a harder sell than the Egyptians were. Why? Because they had a mindset. And every person has a mindset. And many times shame has infiltrated our thoughts in such a way that we cannot hear the voice of God. We cannot fulfill His destiny for our life. And we struggle with reproach. But God said, on this day, your reproach, your shame has been rolled away. And they called the place Gilgal, which actually means your reproach has been rolled away. It's still called Gilgal that day. Have you been to a place called Gilgal in your own life? Have you been to that place where whatever is bringing shame into your life has been rolled away? It's been rolled away. Many times we let one event define our entire life. Sometimes we allow other people to define our lives by one event, right? Just one bad choice, one situation, one mistake. Listen, one mistake does not define who you are. God has something that is so much greater, so much greater, so much greater for us. And there is no shame in asking for help. If you need help today, man, you need to reach out and ask for help. There's somebody that wants to help you. Don't miss it. Several years ago, we were working with a guy that OD'd on hard drugs a couple of times. And this guy had a great job. He was he had an education, he had a great job, he had a really cute wife, he had a little baby, and, and, and we were talking to him, we were like trying to figure out, man, what's going on, why are you doing this to yourself, you know? And uh, as we learned more about the situation, we discovered that this guy's friend died, and he felt responsible for it. Now, he wasn't responsible for his friend's death, but in his own mind he was, and he had a, a spirit of shame and reproach in his life. And the only way he knew how to deal with that was to use the drugs. But when he began to understand that his shame had been rolled away, guess what? He began to walk in freedom over his addiction. This is why so many people go from dysfunctional relationship to dysfunctional relationship to dysfunctional relationship because there's a spirit of shame. And a lot of people think, well, I could never have anybody better. So I'll just get with the guy that, you know, uh, is abusive, just like the last guy. And the same pattern repeats and repeats. And re Why? Because there's shame, there's reproach. It hasn't been dealt with. 
And God said to the Israelites, I'm not going to let you live in the past. I'm not going to let you continue to struggle in the area that you have struggled before. It's a new day. And I'm leading you into a victorious life. Get ready. The, the shame has been rolled away. There's a big difference between guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. Guilt is when we feel bad over a decision that we made. But shame is when we allow that decision to begin to identify our lives. It's when it gets down in us and we begin to see ourselves through that grid and through that lens. That's why it's so destructive. That's why it's so destructive. God gave the Israelites two signs, two signs to help them deal with their shame. And uh, the question is, what symbols has God given to us to overcome shame? You know, symbols are important. Last week we talked about the stones that were excavated from the Jordan River that were put there at Gilgal to remind people how God had parted the waters. And every time the Israelites walked by and they saw the 12 stones of remembrance, they were to tell their children and subsequent generations that God had parted the waters. And there was a symbol that was there, right? But God gave a couple of other symbols in chapter 5. And symbols are so important in the Christian life. We, we don't worship the symbol, but the symbol is a memoir uh, about the goodness and the grace of God. So we don't bow down and worship the Lord's Supper or the stones or whatever, but we remember the great God behind them. And that's where a symbol is powerful. And these two things that we see um, that are symbolic in, in the text here in chapter 5 are circumcision and the Passover meal. Now I know some of you are like, man, today the pastor is going to talk about circumcision. Wow, I feel so inspired in my spiritual journey. I just love God so much more. I feel so much better about my shame because now we've talked about the circumcision. And if you need to be circumcised this morning, you can see an usher right after service. I think we have some... We have some box cutters, I think, in the back. Cheryl will help you with that. We'll help hook you up with whatever you need. But circumcision's a big deal. It's a big Bible deal. Look at verse 2. It says, They made flint knives with, uh, and circumcised the second generation of Israelites. Can you imagine? Okay, now I'm not trying to like be over the top here, but I just want to paint the picture. These are adult males, and they're being circumcised not in a hospital with a scalpel, not with painkillers, but with flint knives, baby. <laughs> All they got is Joshua and the flint knives. That should make every man in this room flinch. Whoa. Man, you had to love God, I'm telling you. But the circumcision was important in biblical times. Why? Because it was the mark of being a believer. And if you read throughout the Old Testament, whenever somebody who was a, a Canaanite or a non-believer uh, another race would join the Jewish people, they would get circumcised because circumcision was the mark of being a believer. It also symbolized the cutting away of the flesh. And both of these themes are echoed in the waters of baptism. Okay, Now here's the great thing today. You can be a Christian and be uncircumcised. Amen. God's made it a lot easier. Guess what? Our circumcision is in the baptism. Okay, And look at Colossians chapter 2 because the Apostle Paul ties these things together so appropriately for us. If you look in verse 10 of Colossians 2, When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Not with the flint knives, in other, words. in other words. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was, was not yet cut away. And then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all of your sins. So what circumcision is in the Old Testament is what baptism is in the New Testament. And this, guys, is why it's so important for us to have believers' baptism. Right? Because... It's the mark of being a believer. Okay? It shows that you are a believer. Now, baptism doesn't make you a believer. Baptism shows that you already are a believer. But it's also a very important part of our 
Christian life. If you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. It's one of the most important things you can do. But listen, when you think about your baptism, why does it matter? Because you remember my shame has been rolled away. Man, every time you see somebody get baptized, you need to remember, man, my shame was rolled away. (laughs) Every time that you see those waters, you remember what God did in you when you were baptized. It's so important. Many people today baptize by um, sprinkling. And that means a lot to many families and uh, is certainly something that many people have done. But you know, the teaching of the New Testament is clear that baptism should always occur by immersion, going underneath the water. Why? Because as we go underneath the water, that's reminiscent of Christ's death. Just as we all personally die to our own flesh and sin and self, we go underneath the water, then we come up out of the water. And what is that a picture of? Our new life, right? We've been forgiven. So there's a beautiful picture in baptism, and it's the mark, man. It's the mark. And if you haven't had believer's baptism as a follower of Jesus, man, do so. I baptized somebody not too long ago that was almost 80 years old. You know, you're not too old. I don't know how old you are, but we had to help this lady into the pool. And that's awesome. That's great. Better late than never. Amen? Yeah, so let's get baptized. I was talking with someone the other day in our church. They had gone over to the Catholic church to see a a friend's baby uh, sprinkled, baptized. And the baby fell asleep during the baptism. And he was telling me about it. He was like, it was so cute. The baby fell asleep. And, And I just thought, you know, is that all the more reason why we should be baptized as a believer? Because if you're a little baby falling asleep, it certainly didn't mean much to you, did it? (laughs) I mean, if you're like, Mommy, bring me my passy, you know? I'd like to have a bottle. Can you hurry up and get this thing over with? I mean, if that's what's going on in your little infantile brain, it probably wasn't that significant. So we need to be baptized. And baptism reminds us that our shame has been rolled away. So Joshua is getting the people ready. And they circumcise all the men. But they also do something in addition to that. They observe the Passover. They observe the Passover. Why is that important? Well, wandering in the wilderness for 40 long years, they had not taken of the Passover meal. And some of us in this room maybe have a Jewish heritage or background or you have friends that are Jewish. and, and, And you know that Jewish people still today take the Passover meal, don't they? It's a big celebration And Jewish people have been doing it for thousands of years. And it's all based on what happened back in the the book of Exodus in the place known as Egypt. And uh, the nine plagues have come on the uh, Egyptian people, but Pharaoh still won't let the slaves go. He still won't let the Hebrew people go. And so God sends the angel of death. But the angel of death passed over every house that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And they were saved. And so the Passover meal reminds them of the blood of the lamb, which they actually eat the lamb in the meal. Okay? By the way, Jesus is the what of God? He's the lamb of God, isn't he? He's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the lamb of God. But the Passover meal reminds people of God's power, of God's strength, of God's faithfulness, of God's goodness, of God's provision, all of those great things. It's kind of like baptism in that way. So God says to the Israelites, get your Passover meal on, get everybody circumcised up, we're ready to go. Now the Passover meal is in the Christian church, we don't observe the Passover because When Jesus took the Passover meal in the upper room shortly before his crucifixion and his arrest, he said, remember two things. He said, remember my body and my blood, right? And so we do an abbreviated meal today. We don't bust out the herbs and the veggies and, you know, all the other stuff because because Jesus said, just remember my body and my blood. So we take what is known today as communion or the Lord's Supper, which is rooted in the Passover meal, But it reminds us of God's goodness and His faithfulness and His sacrifice and all the other things that the Passover meal reminded the Israelites of. 
Why is God having these people practice these symbols and signs? I mean, you would think that perhaps that everybody would be doing push-ups and warfare training and that they would be, you know, practicing getting their weapons together and their battle formations and strategies and all that. They're not doing any of that. They're getting their heart ready. Listen, when your heart is prepared, you will get ready for victory. God will use you. You will be victorious because what is going on on the inside is changing you. Your shame has been removed. And God's just echoing this same message to the Israelites. Listen, you can't think like a slave and be a winner. You can't think like you're oppressed and be victorious at Jericho. You can't do it. So God's getting the people ready through these signs, the Passover and the circumcision. The Passover and the circumcision. And the question, I think, really of the day is, how can my shame be removed? Because, again, every single one of us has stuff that we feel ashamed of. I mean, most of us didn't grow up as slaves, but we've been oppressed. We have thoughts, we have ideas, we have beliefs that, that may or may not be true. We see ourselves as inferior, maybe in, in, in many regards. We see ourselves as somebody that, you know, like maybe God blesses everybody else, but he doesn't bless me, you know. Or God moves in other people's lives, but he doesn't do anything in my life. And, you know, I've done this and, and, and I have the label of shame over my life. And, and, you know, unfortunately, people go through their whole lives. The Israelites had 40 years of shame. There's people that live 60, 70, 80 years with shame. Sometimes it's shame over decisions that we've made. Sometimes the things that have been done to us on our behalf. Parents feel shame in the way that they've raised kids sometimes. When kids make bad choices, parents feel shame. Sometimes, sometimes kids feel shame over the choices that they see their parents make. But we all live with shame. How can God begin to liberate us? How can God roll away the stone of reproach in our own lives? Look with me again in verse 9. He says, Today I have rolled away the shame of slavery in Egypt. All that stuff in your past so that the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Our hope and prayer is that we would be people who spend time in Gilgal. That we would walk in liberty and freedom. So how do we do it? Well, a couple of verses today. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The stone's been rolled away. And then the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. There's no condemnation in Christ. That's why, regardless of what you've done or the path that you've chosen. Listen, in Christ, you're not condemned. Is that good news or what? That's great. Listen, God's solution for your shame is to understand your identity in Christ, who God has made you to be, who God has made you to become. And there is no condemnation in Christ. But we have to make the choice, don't we? We have to make a choice, first of all, to invite Jesus Christ into our life. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning, just as I did at the early service today. People were giving their lives to Christ. Listen, man, there's no greater reason to follow Jesus than to know that you will not be condemned for what you've done. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty amazing. It's pretty fantastic, isn't it? But, you know, just because you're a follower of Christ doesn't mean that you don't struggle in the area of shame. Because you can love Jesus a whole lot. You can follow the Lord with all your heart, and you can still struggle. But we have to make the choice to say, I'm going to live by my new identity, not by my old identity. I'm not going to live according to who I used to be. I'm going to live according to who God has called me to become. My shame has been rolled away. So it's a choice that we make. We also have to not let people shame us. 
as I mentioned before, pe- people love to put labels on people, don't we? we? We do that sometimes. We're all probably a little guilty of that. She did this, label. He did that, label. People go their whole life with a label. We're not identified by one choice in our life. You know, if you look at the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 41, the Pharisees are trying to get in Jesus' business and they're trying to find fault with Jesus and they can't find fault with Jesus. By the way, did you know when people can't find fault with you, they will make things up? <laughs> they will lie to find fault. And that's what, that's what they were doing with Jesus in John chapter 8. So you know what they said? They said, hey Jesus, you, you're like the teacher, you're the prophet, you're the son of God, right? You, you, that's who you say you are? Okay, yeah. All right. Hey, listen, we know that your parents are Mary and Joseph. You're born, you were an illegitimate kid, Jesus. Now, in the 21st century, many kids are born out of wedlock. But in the ancient world, to be born out of wedlock was a stigma that was with you your entire life. And they were trying to bring shame and reproach on Jesus, saying, your parents were doing a little something-something on the side before they got married, so who are you to tell us what we're supposed to be doing? Reproach. Shame. I wonder if that's why Jesus heard the words of God at his baptism. When God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Just to remind him. I mean, Jesus never lived under shame, but, but even if he just got tempted to go down that path, he could remember, I am the son of God. And God's pleased with me. But listen, let's don't let people find reproach in us. Let's don't let people bring shame on us. Uh, Shame can be around us, but it doesn't have to be in us. We have to tune out the voices. Tune out those voices of shame in our life that keep us from becoming who God has called us to be. Don't let people undo what God has started in your life. Well, why do I still feel shame? Did you know the voice of the devil is the voice of the accusation? One of his names in the scripture is the accuser of the brethren, right? And basically that just means he's always trying to find fault. He wants to rob you of joy. He wants to rob you of peace. He wants to bring destruction in your life. He wants to bring disruption in your family. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's he's going around finding fault. It's almost like this. The devil, I just imagine this, he's got a video camera, follows us around... And then whenever he wants to bring shame and reproach in our life, he begins to play those images on our DVR over and over and over again. And sometimes he likes to put things on slow motion. And sometimes he likes to push the rewind button. And many times we just sit there and watch. We're like, yeah, I'm shameful. Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. And we just let it go over instead of stopping and saying, you know what? I'm not going to go down that path anymore. I'm remembering my new identity that I have in Jesus Christ. That's not who I am. That's not who, who I'm becoming. That's not God's purpose for my life. But he wants to destroy us. The devil wants to lower our expectations. What, people will, uh, what we will let people do to us or how we feel about ourselves. Uh, many times insecurity is rooted in shame. I did this, I'm a shameful person, therefore I'm not confident. Uh, Shame is feeling unworthy. Uh, Moses didn't believe that God could use him when he was called to liberate the people in the burning bush. He was giving God every excuse known to man. I think Moses felt shame over the fact he had murdered that Egyptian guard. There's a difference between humility and shame. They might on the outside kind of look the same, but they're not. Moses had to get over his past. That burning bush was a monumental experience for him where God was preparing him to roll away the stone of reproach in his life. Whoa. But our victory is realized in fixing our heart on the truth that the stone of shame has been rolled away It's been rolled away. 
See, every time the devil begins to bring temptation and doubt into our life and shame, we need to remember this. We were predestined. We were highly favored. We were chosen by God. We were called to be a part of his royal priesthood. We were knit together in our mother's womb. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, we are loved. We are forgiven. We are transformed by the Holy Spirit. We are set free. We are saved. We are partakers of his divine nature. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We are blessed. We are the light of the world. And we are overcomers in Jesus' name. Is that good? Come on, let's celebrate that today, church. That's good. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. And the baptism and the Lord's Supper and other things that we do remind us that that's not who I am today. Who I was yesterday is not I am who I am becoming today. And God, God has a plan. God sees me differently. Oh, if we could only learn to see ourselves the way that God sees us, how much more would our lives be transformed? How much more? To Joshua, he said, the stone of reproach has been rolled away. To Jesus, he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. To Isaiah, the unqualified prophet, he said, your lips are cleansed and your sin is atoned for. To Peter, Jesus said, feed my sheep even though you've denied me three times. And therefore, I will not feel unworthy. I will not see myself as a failure. I will not refuse God's forgiveness. I will not live with insecurity. I will not live with shame. I will not listen to the voice of accusation. But I will accomplish everything that God has called me to do because my shame has been rolled away. My shame has been rolled away. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.